Great. Well, um, um, I want to offer my, um, add my welcome to the welcomes that you've already heard this morning. Um, and um, I want to give a particular warm welcome to those who sat down straight away when JP um, started that. Um, and this morning is my hope. Um, my hope is to explain why I sat down. <laughs> um, because as um, Ben said at the beginning, today is the first Sunday of Advent. And maybe if you, when you hear that, you think, oh no, Christmas starts earlier and earlier every year. I haven't even got my Advent calendar yet and Rose is trying to get me in the Christmas spirit already. Now, to those people, you'll be pleased to hear I'm not trying to get you in the Christmas spirit at all. I'm trying to get us in the Advent spirit. And Christmas and Advent occupy very different places in our hearts. Starting with Advent before it gets completely swallowed up in the glitz of Christmas. Sorry, Seven, Danny and Elena. <laughs> I, I'm impressed. <laughs> um, it gives our hearts time to prepare room for Jesus, to prepare him room, to push back against some of the clutter and the distraction. Advent isn't uh, about a um, collective voluntary amnesia in which we try to imagine that Jesus wasn't born and then we're all theatrically surprised on Christmas Day. Advent requires no suspended disbelief at all because instead of some method acting experiment. This season is about using the stories and the images of God's people waiting for their savior to fuel our own waiting. Advent gives us imagination and hope for the day that that same savior will come again. You might have heard the Christian life described as living in the tension between the now and the not yet. We live in the now victory of Jesus. We read that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And we are those who long for our king to come and make all things new. Advent is the time that helps us fix our eyes on the not yet of the now and the not yet. The passage we're going to use to help us do this today is Philippians 3, Verses 20 and 21. Feel free to turn there in your Bible or it will turn up on the screen. This is what Paul writes to the Philippians. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. In these sh like few words, Paul tells us three things. This world is not our home. We are waiting for a savior and he will make wrong things right. So the first thing we're taught in these verses, we are away from home. And even more disorienting than that, our home is somewhere we've never been. Look at verse 20 with me. It says, but our citizenship is in heaven. These words were written to the Philippians, the people who lived in the city of Philippi. And compared to other cities in the Greek world, citizenship was a massive deal in Philippi. Social standing was determined by those who had the privilege of belonging to Rome and those who could call themselves Roman citizens would have had a sense that Rome was their true home. Paul draws on this city's obsession with their citizenship and he lifts the idea into a spiritual reality. So Paul is reorienting their sense of home. He's not just encouraging them to hope in some vague, better place to come when they die. But he's helping them shift their thinking to see that this earth, this age isn't their home at all. I feel a little sorry for that one guy who will have just passed his life in Rome test, <laughs> come into church excitedly clutching it to hear this read out <laughs> at church on that day. However we think about our citizenship, our sense of home, the writers of the New Testament would say the same thing to us. Don't settle down, they would say. 
you are not home yet. One of the 12 disciples called Peter addresses a letter um, in the Bible to people that he refers to as elect exiles. Peter was referring to these people having to leave their hometowns when they became Christians. But if he was writing to us, he could address us in the same way because we all became exiles when we chose to follow Jesus. The moment we acknowledged Jesus as our king, God transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Our citizenship in that moment was relocated to heaven. And suddenly, we were not home here anymore. If home is our idea of where we most belong, where our family is, where we are most safe and known, then this is now most fully true about heaven. And our hearts yearn for a country we've heard about but never been to, ruled by a king we love but have never seen. I wonder if you've ever wondered how Jesus would have felt like an exile here on earth. I don't think anyone understands the feeling of not being at home more than Jesus. He knew this feeling geographically. Luke tells us that he was laid in a manger because there was no place for him. Matthew tells us that as a child, Jesus became a refugee, fleeing an evil government, growing up in a place his parents didn't know. But more than Jesus' physical experience of not being at home was Jesus' spiritual experience of not being at home. Jesus came from eternal glory, ec the ecstatic love he had enjoyed throughout all eternity to empty himself of his glory, a king taking the form of a servant. When John describes Jesus pitching his tent among us, he points out one of the greatest ironies in the cosmos. Jesus became an outsider among the very people he created. As he walked the streets of Nazareth, the very road that he walked on, the very cells and atoms of each passerby were held and sustained in real time by his power. Yet the very people he created in love did not welcome him in. In um, John 1, it says, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. We focus often, and rightfully, on Jesus' physical suffering on the cross and in the days before. Perhaps we don't as often focus on Jesus' emotional and spiritual suffering in being a perfect, sinless man, surrounded on all sides by brokenness. Sin and evil around him, limit and fragility within him. When we see Jesus cry out in desperation in Matthew 17, oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? I don't think this is impatience or grumbling or even insult. This is a cry of immeasurable pain from the spotless one come face to face with the ugliness of sin. If you've ever felt not at home in your own body, in your own family, in the place where you live, Jesus is the one who can most deeply understand that feeling, who can offer you not just pity, but compassion from a heart that has walked the same path before you. Now, I think there are two choices that we're faced with when we read the words, your citizenship is in heaven. When we feel the reality and the discomfort of our not at homeness, we have two things we can do. The first option is to choose distraction and to try and make our home in the world. And this option reminds me a bit of what I'm like at an airport. So statistically, the person or people that I'm traveling with would be more organized than me. And unfortunately for them, that does make me something of a burden. <laughs> 
because I will just defer to their knowledge of where we're supposed to be and when we're supposed to be there. And that leaves me free to test an antisocial amount of perfume in the duty free and blissfully order a full English from the overpriced Weatherspoons at 5 a.m. In my lack of urgency at an airport, I'm not focused on the destination. And without the person with the biggest perspective in mind pointing me to the right departure lounge, I let myself become too distracted by comforts in the in-between place of the airport. In the same way, my lack of urgency in life means I can take my eyes off the destination, my true home, and without the bigger perspective offered to me in scripture, I would risk trying to make this world my home, which would be like trying to live in the airport. The world around us doesn't really help when we're trying to fix our eyes on the home to come because the message all around us all the time, especially at the moment, is about filling emptiness with temporary things. I think James K.A. Smith puts it beautifully. He says, I am absorbed by everydayness. We learn to forget our alienation by letting ourselves be taken over by the distractions and entertainments and chatter of the world. You belong here is the lie told to us by everyone from Disney to Vegas. I don't know what the distractions towards temporary things would be for you, but we all succumb to them all the time. The Bible calls it idolatry, but that's for probably another time. <laughs> when we try to cultivate an image for ourselves, when we cling to money for safety, when we numb ourselves with endless TV series, when we choose social media over prayer, when we put our hope for comfort in the idea of our next holiday, we all give our hope over to things we can see that give us immediate pleasure or comfort. And this is never more pronounced than at Christmas, is it? This is the project of Christmas, I think. Secular Christmas is all about looking at the lights, trying to feel cosy and at home. Advent is, in a way, the opposite to this project. Advent doesn't make us cosy. Advent is all about looking at the darkness head on and asking the Lord to come and take us to the home that all the lights point to. Advent is about pointing us to the destination we're headed to and encouraging us not to spend all our money in that airport weather spoons when there are glorious meals of fish on the beach to come. Before I started talking about my dysfunctional relationship with airports, I um, said that we have two choices when we're faced with the discomfort of our not-at-homeness. So if the first one is distraction, the second one is choosing to embrace the discomfort, and to let it fuel our hunger and our longing for Jesus to return. Again, James K. A. Smith talks about how a faith that embraces our exile does not make false promises for the present. It warns of the allure of imagining that one could settle in and for the present. Hope, he says, is found in a certain art of saying goodbye, but also in looking ahead to the day when someone will greet us with welcome home. We can choose comfort or we can choose hope. And this hope isn't vague. It's as solid as the floor beneath your feet. And it needs to be, because if we're gonna make it through our exile, we need a solid hope of things to come. We need something more than vague ideas of heaven or vague hopes that somehow everything will work out in the end. When our job is tedious, when our child is being bullied at school, when we face abuse and injustice, when we live with infertility or suffer a miscarriage, when we face yet another month of depression, when we feel in our bones the reality that things are not okay, in the face of real, tangible suffering, lack, loneliness, and fragility, we need an equally real and robust expectation of what our home is like, our true home, and how we're going to get there. 
We need something sure and certain that is strong enough to lean our full weight on. We need a living hope. In his next sentence in our passage today, Paul tells us what this is. He says, and from it we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are waiting for the arrival of something, or rather, someone. Now, when you think about the return of Christ, I don't know what comes to mind for you or what emotion it evokes. I ask this because I believe that how we think and feel about the return of Christ has a profound effect on how we live the Christian life. Much of the New Testament has this urgency, this tone of eager waiting, like brimming in its pages. It is the context and the motivating factor of so much of the encouragement about how we live as exiles who are not yet at home. The sad thing is, when we think about the return of Christ, we're often confused at best or fearful at worst. And both of these responses will keep us from waiting eagerly for Jesus to return. And it will make us more likely to tether ourselves to passing comforts. So we're going to look now quickly, I promise, (laughs) um, at what we're actually waiting for when we talk about Jesus' return. And I want to talk about five real things that we can put our hope in. So the first real thing, a real day. Jesus' first coming, arriving in that stable in the little town of Bethlehem, happened on a real day in history. It's deliberately told in a way that almost couldn't be more real. You can almost smell and hear the realness of it. Ragged shepherds, noisy animals, blinding angels. In the same way, the return of Christ is going to be an actual day. The final day in history, the end of the age, and we will all be there. Whether we are asleep, as the Bible calls it, waiting with Jesus, or still alive on the earth, every human who has ever lived will be there on that day. All of human history and all of creation waits with eager longing for this day to come. Real thing number two, a real person. Our hope, our home, the end of our wandering will be found in the arrival of the one we love, our saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what it says in 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. When we realise the brokenness of the world around us, when we remember again that our citizenship is in heaven, it can feel like what we're most eagerly waiting for is for the pain to be over. And that will be an amazing thing. But the moment we see him, every moment of suffering we've experienced will suddenly seem light and momentary in the light of the glory and the beauty we behold in the face of the beloved. The most glorious thing that Christ will do for us on that day is give us himself. Because the most wonderful thing about Jesus is Jesus himself. We will always be with the Lord. Can you think of more wonderful words? Okay, real thing number three, real judgment. Now, I would guess this is the one that causes the most pangs of doubt and fear when we think of the return of Christ, who will come as our bridegroom, but also as our judge. There's a lot we could say on this, but here's what we need to know. Jesus has already experienced the judgment day. And on that day, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. What that means is Jesus has taken the judgment that should have been ours 
And now we are judged according to his perfect record. If you have placed your trust in Jesus, then God has placed your sin on him and you bear it no more. We do not need to fear the judgment of Jesus for he will never cast you out. Real thing number four, a real body. Now, I want you all, if you're able, to just uh, grab your ear. Yeah, great, great. Now, just give it a little, just give it a little shake. Yeah. <laughs> right now in heaven, Jesus is able to do that because he has a real human body. I like to think that maybe he did just, just for the lols. And for all eternity, you will be able to do that because you will have a real human body. This is exactly what Paul says in our passage today. The Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Imagine a body that doesn't falter or fail, that doesn't ache or bruise or break or fade. Imagine a mind that doesn't worry or fret or panic or obsess. Imagine... No sleepless nights, no cramps, no suicidal thoughts, no stubbed toes, no nosebleed, no vomiting, no dementia, no paper cuts. When you feel the not-at-homeness that life in this fallen body brings, remember that not only will you have a real body with none of the corruption and the decay caused by the fall, but your body will be like Jesus's glorious body we will be glorious. Again, not enough time to go into that, but isn't that amazing? (laughs) And finally, real thing number five. I don't know why it sounds like a a game show. (laughs) Number five, a real place. We are not going to be floating on a cloud. (laughs) Revelation 21 talks about a new heaven and a new earth. Your new body, where you can wiggle your ear, will be on a real earth. Doesn't this help us with our understanding of home? He's coming to make a garden city where God will dwell with us. There will be real trees and real music, real friends, real water, bread and wine, and a really real Jesus. When I feel my not at homeness, it does not comfort my soul to imagine myself as this personalityless, disembodied spirit wafting around for all eternity. What does encourage me is to know that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for me, that there is a seat at that banquet with my name on it, that the dwelling place of God will be with man, that he will dwell with us and he will be our people, we will be his people, that he himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. That there will be no mourning, no crying, no pain anymore. For the former things will have passed away and we will be home. Real day, real person, real judgment, real body, real place. We had some people around to our house this weekend and before they came, I bought some food, I cleaned the bathroom, I put away some shoes. (laughs) My knowledge that people were coming affected my decisions and my priorities that day. Chris Davis writes, God means for the return of Christ to change our lives, not only in mystical or emotional ways, but in our schedules and stewarding of our desires. This advent as we make space to think about our heavenly citizenship and long for the return of Christ, there are simple practices that God gives us as gifts to help us push back the distractions. Here are just a couple of examples that we read about in the Bible. Gathering together. This is a simple one, and in a way I'm preaching to the choir because you're all here, so... (laughs) Um, The writer of the book of Hebrews encourages us not to neglect to meet together, but to encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. 
It's an interesting he connects this idea of gathering together and looking to the day that's coming. We need each other to keep pointing each other to Jesus, to lift us out of our momentary distractions. Let's not let this December pass us by. Why not take some time this Advent season to pray with friends or housemates or your spouse about focusing your heart on the home to come? I realize my next one might not be the most welcome suggestion (laughs) for December, especially as that Christmas baked goods aisle in the middle just gets better and better. But you could consider fasting this Advent. Jesus talks about fasting as a natural response to wishing that the bridegroom was with us. Fasting is a great one for aligning ourselves with our not at homeness. It makes the body feel something of the reality of our souls. And my final suggestion for a way to engage with Advent is what we're going to do right now. We're going to take the Lord's Supper together. Chris, if I could invite you. Oh, there he is. <laughs> like he's left. No, he's here. Um, uh, we're going to um, share the Lord's Supper together. This is for those of us that have decided to follow Jesus. So if you would say, well, I'm not quite sure that's me, I'd really encourage you to just stay in, your, stay in your seat, enjoy the rest of the service. There's nothing you have to do. Um, but if you'd call yourself a Christian, I'd love you to get up and um, grab some bread and wine from, there are four stations all around the room. Um, so go and do that nice and quickly right now and then we will um, we'll carry on. Don't eat or drink anything yet. Just hold on to it. <laughs> um. the last am I on yeah yeah just as the last of us are getting the bread and wine one of the things that the Lord's Supper does in us is to help us eagerly await Jesus is coming as we eat this bread and drink this wine we imagine what it will be like to eat with him face to face to feast in the new creation communion is supposed to like wet our appetites and make us both satisfied in Jesus and hungry for him at the same time. We'll start by eating the bread after I've read these words from Luke. When the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And now the cup. Maybe we could stand for this one, actually, if we're able. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes.
Jesus, we long for that day where the kingdom of God comes, where we don't just see in part, but we are with you face to face, where we don't need symbols because we have the real thing with us. Though we have not seen you, we love you, Jesus, and we long for your return. Lord, would you point us again to that day? Would you help us (laughs) to fix our eyes on you, to set our faces towards that day? We say, come, Lord Jesus.